Hearing you fine. Okay, well, if you read the uh, pamphlet, you probably know a little bit about how I got into the Army. Thank you. Uh, there was this thing called the draft, which every young man back in the 60s and very early 70s had to contend with. Uh, most people uh, contended with it by being in school or being married. Then you, that gave you a deferment. Um, well, even though I was at uh, CSU in Fort Collins for three plus years, I had four majors and I was going to my fifth major. So I said, well, why, why should I continue with this? I'll just drop out, go to Aspen, live the life, go through the ski school clinic and be a ski instructor. Well, before that actually occurred, I started getting these registered letters at each place I lived in in Aspen. And back then, young Americans could take time off from their job or whatever and go to Aspen or Vail and actually live there. You can't do that anymore, it costs too much. Um, anyhow, these letters were getting closer and closer. And I never opened these letters, okay? And uh, so I would move someplace else. Uh, but those letters would keep catching up with me. Well, one day I was in the post office. I think it was actually the main post office in Denver. And I saw that thing, that pamphlet, and I said, be a helicopter pilot in the U.S. Army as a warrant officer. So I looked at that and I said, well, I don't know if it's in here, but I thought to myself, you know, flying over the jungle is better than marching through the jungle. And that was my decision point right there to uh, uh, get qualified before I joined. I did get qualified, fully qualified. Uh, and then I joined and then in uh, January 66, went to Fort Polk, Louisiana for basic training, on to primary helicopter school at Fort Walters, Texas, then advanced helicopter school at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And uh, I became a pilot in February 1967. Uh, back then, uh, Vietnam, of course, was a big deal. And most people who graduated out of flight school went to Vietnam. My graduating class was 260 people, the largest class at the time. And then following that, every class after that was larger yet. By the time I got back from Vietnam, the Army was graduating 600 pilots a month of which most of them did go to Vietnam. Uh, there were lucky few that went to Germany, but everybody went to Vietnam sooner or later. Okay, so I think if I get this thing going. Fort Walters, Texas is at Mineral Wells, about 40 miles west of Fort Worth. And uh, so that's where the Army had its primary helicopter school. I trained in the OH-23 Raven, which is that right there. And so we spent six months in uh, Texas uh, learning how to solo, solo, uh, doing auto rotations, uh, cross country. The Brazos River ran near there and we, there were a lot of little perches on the river <coughs> that we would, we would practice our uh, approaches to and departures from. Okay, Fort Walters at the time was turning out students so fast that Fort Rucker, the next stop, couldn't really take it, take all the people coming out of Walters. So we were held over for a month. And in fact, for a year period, <clears throat> most of the classes were held over at Fort Walters. So eventually we did get out of there. That is what I soloed in, again, an OH-23 Raven. This will be on the quiz as to what kind of helicopter this is. Okay, they did tell you there's gonna be a quiz, right? Uh, well, I'll have to talk to these people later, I guess. Okay, this is my section. I think I'm in there somewhere. There were eight sections and eventually we all got out of there, out of there to Fort Rucker. Okay, that's an H-13T, which was the basic instrument trainer. And I can see I'm gonna be uh, relying on that a lot. So the first month at Fort Rucker was basic instruments. And what it is, you get in it, you have a flight instructor. There's a panel, um, can't really see it. On the other side, the student's in the right seat. So there's a panel that, that covers your side view. 
a panel under the, the bottom of the bubble and you put on a little hood and he says, okay, take off, let's go fly. And of course you can't see anything out of the aircraft and you say, what did you say? Okay, then he says, well, you have to look at the instruments. Okay, we're gonna fly instruments. So by looking at the instruments, which you gradually learn to trust because again, you can't see outside. You, you, you do have sensations, which you have to learn to uh, ignore. So it's all instrument flying. So for the first month, how to do an instrument take off from the ground without seeing the ground, fly straight and level, tur turns, climbs and descends, stuff like that. So that's the first part of instrument training. Second part is in a, an A model Huey. Uh, there are a number of versions of the Huey. The A models originally went to Vietnam, but, but by the time I got on scene, <clears throat> all the A models had come back to become trainers. And here you can see, uh, oops, get back there. Little cover there, I sit in the right seat. Again, a panel comes across and I have a hood on. So I'm, we're shooting instrument approaches tactical instrument approaches, GCAs or ground control approaches, and that's the next, this is the second month. Finally, we, even though we were flying in Hueys, we weren't officially qualified in a Huey. Then we had <coughs> a month of Huey qualification. And that is the first Huey I ever flew solo, totally solo, December 66. Okay, tactical training. We're flying low-level navigation flights over northern, Cal northern uh, Florida, southern Alabama, and uh, southern Georgia. I'm in the jump seat, the other student you can see there, and we're just following this river for a while. And again, from the, from the back seat, I just shot another helicopter out to the side there. Um, we all had gunnery training. That's a... Uh, <coughs> a UH-1C, a gunship. There are no guns on it right now, but um, those are the ammunition shoots right there. When they actually do go shoot, they will put the uh, two M60 machine guns on this side, two on the other side. Plus, we'll shoot rockets. And everybody at that time in flight school went through the exact same syllabus. Since then, they, they've branched out into different tracks. But when I went through, everybody did the same thing. There's a minigun on this. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a minigun there and they're uh, harmonizing the guns. There's one here, one on the other side. And there's a target a couple thousand meters downrange and they're just basically bore sighting the guns to targets. But anyhow, we shot miniguns, we shot the M60 machine gun, we shot rockets. It was just a whole lot of fun. Well, finally, we all got graduated. And then all of us who going to Vietnam, we went to Vietnam. Now, what happens in Vietnam, they send you some orders sending you to a unit. Didn't make any difference what unit. That was just to get you to Vietnam. Here we're at Benoit Air Force Base. Uh, north of Saigon. From there, you go to the 90th Replacement Battalion, or a lot of people did. I, you know, Other people went to Cameron Bay, other people went to Da Nang, but Benoit, I think, was the main, main point where uh, new soldiers came into, uh, into Vietnam. And what did I want to say about that? Well, at the 90th Replacement Battalion, you get your jungle fatigues, you get your jungle boots, you get a little bit of orientation. Then they send you wherever they've decided to send you at that point. Well, they sent me to the uh, 57th Medical Detachment at Long Bin. And uh, so this is the Long Bin dust off heliport. Long Bin was the largest base in the Vietnam War, 60,000 people. And it was many different compounds that came together <coughs> as they were moving headquarters companies and units out of the Saigon area. They went north to Long Bin, 
five miles from Benoit and about 15 miles north of Saigon. Uh, so this is the long bin dust off heliport. This is the 93rd Avac Hospital there, okay? This is Highway 1, which goes from Hanoi in North Vietnam down to Benoit, to Saigon, and west to Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So that's the major highway. Looking south, we're looking south as we look at the slide, Saigon is about 15 miles south. The Dong Nai River runs through Benoit, connects with the Saigon River, and becomes Saigon Harbor as it all meets up later on. Okay, so there were three detachments. I was in the 57th Medical Detachment. There were two other medical detachments that put 21 helicopters here. Obviously, they're not, they're not all here. They're at standby locations throughout the area. So the area we covered was three corps. There are four corps in Vietnam. There's a little dash line here. Core, uh, one corps, or I corps, two corps, the Central Highlands, three corps, well, here's Saigon. Three corps goes from maybe 100 miles north of Saigon down to uh, somewhere, th there's a division be down to four corps. Anyhow, so what we covered was th the three corps area from about here down to uh, the bottom tributary of the Mekong River here and from the South China Sea to Cambodia. While I'm here, I was in the 44th Med Brigade. That uh, covered most of the hospitals and most of the dust off helicopters in Vietnam. Didn't need that anyway. Okay, like I said, there were 21 helicopters here when I arrived. Two of the detachments left. That left seven helicopters. The 45th Med Company came in with 21 of its own helicopters. So we had <coughs> about 28 helicopters, of which three were uh, assigned here on any, any, any day, and a lot of them were to eight or nine different other locations about, around the three-court area. They'd do three-day standbys and then come back. Someone else would go by or go back and take their place. And what else do I need to say about Long Bin? Who knows? Well, let me back up again. Right <coughs> there is the main place where people come in and drop off their patients whether it's us as desktop pilots or whether it's somebody else coming in to drop off patients. And they drop off a patient, the people from the hospital run out, get it, take them in, and who knows what happens then. So here is one, one of our aircraft dropping off a patient. And uh, just by the fact that this guy has a crutch, that tells me this helicopter was, was on, uh, its duty for the day was hospital transfer. Uh, there were three helicopters at any given time. First up was the first guy to go if there was a call. He's on duty 24 hours a day, day or night. The siren would go off. One siren blast would go off for first up. If they needed another helicopter, two siren blasts for the second helicopter, and he would go. Would a medic be part of your crew? A pilot, co-pilot, medic, and crew chief, four people, okay? Um, yeah, keep asking questions. If I don't see your hand, throw something. <laughs> if you're going to throw something, make it one of those donut holes. <laughs> okay. and, let, and, let, and let you know it's coming. Yeah, so I can <laughs> get in the right position there. This is our operations building. Um, we had a little operations tower there, which nobody ever used, but we would go in here and get our mission. And normally when the, when the siren went off, the pilot or the, the co-pilot, it, it was called aircraft commander, who was the guy in command, pilot, who was actually the co-pilot, medic and, uh, and crew chief. 
I, as the, the piloting commander, the aircraft commander, I'd run in here, get the mission slip, tells me where it is, when it is, what it is, and then... Uh, the gunners? Huh? Who ran the guns? We, dust off helicopters did not have guns. Okay, now, so most of the medical helicopters had the dust off call sign. They, they did not have the side M60 machine guns. Other units that flew medical helicopters, the 1st Cavalry Division, for example, they had their own medical helicopters. They did not use the dust off call sign. They used, their call sign was medevac. They were a little bit smarter than us. They did have side M60 machine guns, okay? They, but when we get, went into a LZ, which we thought was hot or going to be hot, everybody had their M60 out, their M16 out. And the guy not flying would have his 45 out doing that, you know, if he thought there was somebody down there. You, you never really saw anybody on the ground, or at least not for, as a helicopter uh, crew member. But if you strongly suspected that somebody was going to shoot at you, the whole idea about shooting back was to keep their heads down so they don't shoot at you. It's not so much trying to kill anybody, you just, you're trying to survive yourself. That's the whole idea of whether it's us, you know, as medevac pilots trying to get into a place and get out. Uh, more on that later. Okay, there's a helicopter going by. I talked about first up, second up, third up. If you're second up, you had a, a rescue hoist. And uh, with a rescue hoist, you had either a Stokes litter, which a guy can lay flat on, and there's a little cage around it so it doesn't fall out when you're picking it up, or what's called a forest penetrator. Um, this is a forest penetrator. If we're over three canopy forest and, and we need to pull somebody out, we normally cannot see the ground. And we have to rely upon the people at the ground for micro uh, adjustments as to where we're hovering. You know, so we'll get over their area, but normally they're gonna see us more than we see them. So they'll tell us, go forward, go left, go right, whatever. Then we drop this thing down now this has its three arms extended. When it goes down through the trees, these three arms are up and the strap here holds it all together. So it can penetrate down through the forest. So what the, the guy does, he straddles, they put the arms out, they straddle him on, on these arms and make sure he's secure, then we pull him up through the trees. Hopefully he doesn't get caught in the trees. But anyhow, this is the second up guy and uh, most helicopters did not use this, but we did on our, quote, second up. Uh, Is that you in the photo? No, no, that's someone else. That's from the VHPA, uh, Vietnam Helicopter Pilots Magazine. That's someone else. But, so I copied that. I will give it back, I will give the picture back to him, okay? <laughs> okay. Alrighty, so. Okay. That's some of our helicopters undergoing maintenance, who knows what. Okay, that's kind of a view of some of the helicopters. We're at Longman Heliport. heliport. Uh, down there where the smoke is, that's Benoit Air Force Base. On a regular basis, sappers would go in, sneak into the base, Viet Cong sappers, and they'd blow up the JP-4 farm where, you know, where all the jet fighters were. This happened on a regular base, bases, like I say. So, the road was, a, was a, the ammunition dump. They moved that quite often. Well, the, February 68 was the big blow, and I was there for that. And from the tower that I showed you, that small tower, the long bit ammunition dump is the other way. And there were 155 millimeter shells, 15,000 of them went up in a big cloud. and. It took, it took five hours for the whole thing to blow up. And uh, at the end, it was kind of building up to a huge crescendo of explosions, you know, boom, 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 155 millimeter, sh millimeter shells. And it looked like an atomic cloud went up. So I, I was in the tower watching all this good stuff. 
that was the highlight of my whole career over there, by the way, watching that. And I, I saw this mushroom cloud go up, and I, I ducked down behind the wall, and I grabbed the radios that were up there, hoping that you know, they wouldn't crush me too bad when the whole thing went over. But luckily, the, uh, the concussion was, wasn't all that bad. So everything after that was just kind of nothing. We had visitors in Air Force Huey, the 20th Special Operations Squadron. They did uh, secret stuff across the border. This is Benoit Air Force Base Rescue. This is a, a Cayman Husky helicopter. It has a very strange sound to it. It has, is really a, an egg beater type of arrangement. They, the rotor blades intermesh. It had a swishing sound to it. Uh, but it was used for, normally they'd have a fire bottle under here, and what they would do with a burning aircraft, if it crashed, they'd come up to it and kind of get to the side where the crew is, and then they'd blow the fire away just by the rotor wash of the helicopter and spray foam on it, okay? So that worked pretty good. And they didn't have a tail rotor? They had no tail rotor. So they just had two of these counter-rotating blades. The good thing about having a helicopter without a tail rotor is that all of the power goes to the lifting rotor system. Normally, uh, in most helicopter designs, about 15% of the power is, is used by the tail rotor just to keep the thing aimed the way you want it to aim. Okay, that's one of the first OH-6s, uh, a Hughes OH-6 or a loach, we called them, light observation helicopter. And uh, that's our refueling area back there. And so I took a bigger picture of him because that was the first one I'd ever seen. Summer 67. Chinooks came in on a regular basis either hauling back a helicopter that they'd retrieved from the field somewhere or they could bring in their own, their own uh, wounded, or sometimes just passengers. This guy sh shows the record of what he's rescued there. That's the typical scene, um, and I should probably talk about terrain here. Just do that for now, so I don't trip over it. Here's Saigon, Benoit, Long Ben, from here, north, is all wooded terrain, all the way up. From here, south, is all rice paddy. Saigon was made out of rice paddies. Um, Long Bend kind of, and Benoit were sort of divisionary, and so everything up here is north, that, and uh, down by the Mekong River, and the Delta, several tributaries to the Mekong River, that's all rice paddy. So anyhow, that's a three core area, three core area. Some of it's triple canopy jungle. Okay, you'd often see these rows of holes in the ground. These are B-52 strikes, okay? And uh, whenever that was going to occur, you would hear on the emergency frequencies on the radio, quote, this is a... Uh, Paris control, Paris, well, Saigon is known as the Paris of the East, so their air traffic control was run by what they called Paris control, just like we have Denver approach control, they had Paris approach control. And they would say, extremely heavy artillery, and that was the code word for B-52 strike. And they'd give the coordinates, and you, of course, want to go the other way, so. <laughs> yeah. most, of, most, most of the B-52 strikes were at night, but, Dust off guys flew a lot at nighttime compared to the other helicopters. Uh, since we're on 24 hours a day, a regular lift company with slicks or regular Heelys, they do all the lifting of troops in the daytime. And the gunships, they do the support with the lift troops in the daytime. <clears throat> but at the end of the day for them, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's Miller time. But for, well, it's always Miller time. But anyhow, for us at night, uh, we did a lot of night calls and everybody else was asleep. We got more nighttime than anybody else, basically. 
Okay, we're kind of in the southern part of the country. It is monsoon season. There are clouds. There's water on the ground. Not sure where we're going. I don't know if you can really see that, but there is a, uh, a row of APCs. You know, just like how the Americans going west had their covered wagons, they put them in a circle at night. When a lot of units went from point A to point B, they put all their armored personnel carriers in the circle and the admin stuff in there, and that's where they'd hold the ground for a while. So you'd see that in different places where you went. Uh, back at Longbin, there's a nice view of early dusk. Isn't that pretty? And there's another, and there's a night view. Isn't that pretty? That's even prettier most of the time. There is always something going on at night in long been, well, in many areas, there is always something going on. So these are flares. I don't know what's really going on, but going on, but something's going on. And again, we were on call at night. I need to talk about how we got from one place, from our base to where they called us. Normally, we had the same maps called a 1 to 50,000 that the ground troops used. So the, the scale is 1 to 50,000. But at night, you cannot see the ground. So how do we get to from where we were here at Long Bend out to someplace near the Cambodian border where there's no lights at all on the ground? We would call Paris Control. And it would go something like this. Paris Control, dust off 2-3, off Long Bend, squawky 3-2-3. Three, Flash, uh, request flight following and pigeons to the following coordinates. So in English, that means I'm off. I just took off, took off a long bend. I am me. They know who I am, and I want to go to this location. Please help me. They had an overlay of the Army tactical map on their radar scope, okay, on their radar display. So they would normally just give us a heading to go to the grid coordinate I have given them. And then just before we get there, they'd say, well, you're within five or 10 miles. I'd say, thank you very much. And then I would call the people on the ground. And then I would say, hello, I'm me. We're coming in. What do you have? What's the tactical situation? And they would say, well, the enemy's on this side of us. Come on in from the, this other side. And we're going to and you have three guys to pick up. And uh, the train is either level or it has trees or they're going to tell us whatever they they're going to tell us, we're going out there pitch black. We have no navigation lights on. We have no other lights on because we'd be the only light in the sky with every, so everybody could shoot us, you see. So normally what they would do, they would turn on a uh, some kind of small light. Normally it was a flashlight. They'd put their red LEDs aboard on it. Do you see this? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so... We also had what was called FM homing in the aircraft, and it was an instrument. It was, if you're familiar with the ILS localizer in an aircraft, it's an instrument which has a vertical needle. Which, if you're headed to where they're talking, the needle would go to the right. If you're headed this way and they're over there and they're talking, they give you a short count. The needle would go over there, so that gives us left and right. Uh, there's a horizontal needle that goes up and down. It gives strength of their radio. Okay. Meanwhile, we kind of know what the terrain elevation is. Between the South China Sea and Cambodia, uh, at the Saigon level, nothing is above 100 feet above sea level. So we'd kind of start our approach not even looking, not seeing anything on the ground. And then that kind of directed us closer to where they were Eventually, they would see their blinking red light, and we'd start an approach angle into it. And uh, on, on short final, I would normally turn on the navigation lights, <clears throat> which gives us a little bit of peripheral vision. But I wouldn't do it until we were actually pretty close, in my estimation, to the ground. Uh, so that's nighttime navigation. Okay, well, then we pick them up. What we picked up was never what they said we were going to pick up. Never. I don't think I ever picked up what they said they were going to pick up. Uh, you don't know what you're going to pick up. On more than one occasion, I'd land and 
the whole squad would jump aboard and they'd say, go, 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 go. Well, I'm not going to sit there and argue with them. You know, we came out here to pick up a patient, and so we don't want people. No, I'm not going to argue with them. You know, they know more about what's on the ground than I do. So if that happened, we would do it. Um, so there's all kinds of people we picked up. We pick up Americans, South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese civilians, um, anybody who, who was shot and who needed uh, attention. So anyhow, that's a nighttime rescue. Then we'd, we'd take off, an instrument take off normally, and then uh, get some altitude, and I'd, I'd call Saigon or Paris Control, and I'd say, we're off, and we're headed back to whichever hospital we're headed to. Did then, you use any miscue sites? Any what? Of the miscue sites? I didn't hear you. <laughs> miscue sites. What is that? What is that? Well, they directed bomb. Uh, they were radar <coughs> No, the only radar help was Saigon approach or Paris approach. Um, we had no radar altimeter. We had no weather radar. We had an altimeter, an airspeed indicator, and a heading indicator and stuff like that. And most people didn't even never use that. Uh, we were a single ship mission the whole time. Everybody else worked. All other helicopters worked as groups. The, the lift ships that took a, a unit of troops to point A to point B, and it could be between 10 and 20 helicopters, so, so they had their leader. The gunships, there'd be at least uh, two to four that might, may have accompanied a lift into an area. And then there were scout helicopters, and they were all part of that gaggle, okay? And they, they were looking for the enemy. And then there was the CNC, or the command and control helicopter. So he kind of directed operations. So for those guys, they all kind of followed along with what CNC said. For us, we arranged everything for where we're going and got in and get out by, our, got in, got, get out by ourselves. OK, so <coughs> that was nighttime uh, navigation. Oh, that's my room, by the way. Uh, well, the, uh, the, uh, the seat has a little bit to be desired, but this is a typical uh, army uh, billeting uh, in your hooch. Everything was called a hooch. And there were U.S. companies that made billions of dollars building these things all over Vietnam. It, it's slatted wood. You can see light, and then up on the top there would be... Uh, um, a screen and then a tin roof. And then there were usually about uh, six or eight uh, such rooms in any building. But they, they varied. But you got used to it. So after a while, if you lived in these things for a while, what you wanted was ammunition boxes. And with those ammunition boxes, you could take the wood out and have your own wood paneling after a while. And then if you go to the PX, you can get all the latest uh, uh, video equipment and audio equipment, and so some guys really had everything set up, assuming they were there for a while. The guy who set this place up, well, he had it sort of set up. He had uh, uh, teak uh, players and Sam Sui uh, and all, uh, every, all the latest gear you could have. The PX had, and you can go get it set up your room and. Uh, but unfortunately, two months after I got there, he was shot down and wounded, and they sent him home. Uh, he never flew again, and I guess he died just a few years ago. Uh, where are we at? A place called Long Thon, which is east of Long Bin. These are actually some other pilots from the 57th Med, Deta Med Detachment in my graduating class. I don't know what we're doing there, but there we are. Okay, we're driving through downtown Benoit, and we're en route to probably Saigon. But that's the main avenue through Benoit, uh, Vietnam. Another view of it. That bridge goes over the Dong Nai River. Uh, Benoit is on this side, and I'm not sure what it is on the other side there. 
Okay, if we go in, if we go into Benoit by air, we're on, we're on uh, long final to Benoit Air Force Base right now. They had F-100 Super Sabres based there during the time that I was in country. During the Tet Offensive of 68, a um, little later in my tour, which was sort of a rather busy time, the, um, the F-100s would take off of their airport, do a few circles, then they'd strafe their own airport because the Viet Cong were running across the airfield. That was part of what was happening at that time. <coughs> at Benoit, which was the headquarters of the Vietnamese Air Force, these are Vietnamese Sky Raiders. There was one right there. They had F-5 Freedom Fighters, which we gave them, along with all the other stuff. And also at Benoit, here's a C-130 with a drone, you know, reconnaissance uh, drone there and one on the other side. I got to Benoit quite often and you, you could see anything there. There'd be U-2s, didn't see any B-52s, but you know, you'd see a lot of strange stuff there. But going back to when the French were fighting the, uh, the communists, this is a World War II F-8F Grumman Bearcat in VNAF or Vietnam Air Force colors. This is at the front gate. Uh, going east of, uh, of uh, Long Bend and the Benoit area, this is Black, <coughs> excuse me, Black Horse, headquarters of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. One of the many bases we visited and flew out of. We're on the ground here. That is the color of the dirt. And uh, it's kind of wet. One thing about in Vietnam, it's either mud or it's dust. There is no in between. Okay, so you had to contend with one or the other. It's very slick. Very slick, right. Uh, this is the most heavily barbed wire area of the uh, Black Horse area. This is the female nurses' quarters. Now, it was never explained to me to keep from getting out or to keep everybody else from getting in. But anyhow, that's how it was. Okay, we did do some operations out of Black Horse. Now, I didn't photograph these things very often, but we're in an LZ in the woods, and uh, this guy's coming out on a stretcher. This guy's, pro this is probably the guy I was talking to on the radio. He has his uh, uh, radio out. But anyhow, they found a clearing for us. Sometimes they have to modify the clearing. Sometimes we can't land and they just have to hand the guy up to us. Okay, a little closer shot. We're running the whole time. Um, they're just as anxious to get him out as we are to get ourselves out. Okay, this is the view. Looking back, um, there's people, there's usually uh, room for three stretchers back here. So there's nothing really that the pilot and co-pilot can do uh, except watch the medic do whatever he's doing. He has his body armor on, front and back. Call them chicken plates. Um, my first night landing, we're going to go till 3 o'clock, it's okay, right? My first night landing, uh, the guy I was flying with, who was teaching me how to make a night landing, lights off, with no lights on the ground. So we had every light off. We came in to, to a Black Horse on that previous road I showed you, and we hit pretty hard. And what it did, doesn't show it here, but it spread the skids out, and the belly of the helicopter was, was sitting on the, on the road. So uh, this is the next day. This thing is being, it's coming back to Long Bend. The following night, I flew with him again, and he was going to show me again how to make a night landing <laughs> to the same place. And he said, okay, Chuck, you know, well, I was in the right seat, and the controls of the landing lights and everything are on the right seat. He was in the left seat. Just a sidebar, the reason he's in the left seat, 
the instrument panel is off to the right a little bit in a Huey, so you can, the guy in the left seat actually has a better view of the ground through the chin bubble than the guy in the right seat. He can't, he's looking at an instrument panel there. So anyhow, he's in the left seat. I said, Chuck, don't turn on the landing light until I tell you. I, okay, okay, okay. So we're making our approach, and all of us, the hair kind of, the hair that I had kept coming up. <laughs> Man, so I'm like, nobody can see anything. So I flipped on the landing light, I disobeyed orders, and there's a huge tree right in front of us. <laughs> and then he immediately went to the left and went to the right. Okay, so after that, he never ever told me not to turn on the landing light again. <laughs> I saw him after we both got back from Vietnam, and he said, well, I'm surprised you lived through it. But anyhow, usually I would try to lay the lights off if I, if I really knew what was going on on the ground, or I just use a minimum amount of navigation light, or at short final, I would turn on a, a landing light. So everybody had their own technique. Some techniques are better than others. Okay, this is a UH-1C gunship with the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, okay? That has the 11th ACR uh, it's the horse with a black and white uh, background, or red and white background. There is a minigun on here, it's hard to see in this slide. Seven shot rocket tube on this side and the same thing on the other side. So. Okay, still a black horse. This is the used tank farm. I don't know if they're for sale or what, but anyhow. <laughs> okay, you've all heard of the tunnels of Kuchi. This is Kuchi, Kuchi Military Base. Um, headquarters of the 25th Infantry Division, Michael's alma mater, and uh, it's a big place, and uh, that's the runway there. We're gonna go land here. We're kind of landing along the runway looking for a place to park among the empty revetments. And at Kuchi, you know, the Army had some airplanes and the Air Force had some airplanes. Here's the Army O-1 bird dog. The Air Force had an O-1 bird dog. This guy's loaded with uh, eight rockets, Willie Peat or white phosphorus warheads, which are actually the best marking rockets. They're, they're better than the, quote, smoke rockets. Also, they do a little damage by themselves. C-7 uh, caribou taking off of the runway. Um, okay, this is a, okay. So uh, this guy is gonna get lifted up and hauled back to wherever he came from. Um, usually what happens is there's the, the, the rigging crew comes in first on a Huey and they, get all the rigging ready, and then they call in the Chinook because they don't want the Chinook just hanging around there doing nothing. He's a nice big target. Once they're ready, um, they call in the Chinook, he comes in, and they hook it all together. Uh, I always heard you could get a tremendous electric shock. I was going to just go into that. Right. On, on your FM radio, what we call the Fox Mike radio, the pilot would normally transmit, and that would release the uh, static electricity which builds up on the, on the line here. And also the ground crew, they have a, a little metal bar which they touch the, uh, the pickup uh, cable first in case the pilot forgets. But you, you have to do this right before he grabs it again because almost immediately that static charge starts coming up again. So anyhow, they're about ready to pick it up and take it back to where it came from. Okay, we're at uh, Lai K. That's my crew, that's my helicopter that you've seen. But this building behind us is a museum. And that's the inside of a muse the museum um, with a lot of captured Viet Cong stuff. Among the captured stuff, which I thought was kind of inter interesting, was do you notice any hand grenades that look, might, might look familiar to you? <laughs> well, they take our refuse and they make weapons out of them and hand them back to us. They would take 
Artillery shells that didn't go off. They take bombs that didn't go off, disassemble it, take the explosive out, put it in some kind of container, get the fuses from somewhere, and they were used against us. They were more ingenious than we really gave them credit for. Okay, still at Lyk, we're taking off north along the main runway and you can see all the aircraft parked here. This is the uh, artillery battery. I don't know if you can see them, but there's a 105 howitzer there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. A battery is six tubes or six artillery uh, pieces. Now the whole thing about artillery, um, part of our daytime navigation is the whole three core area was covered by artillery fans. So normally going from point A to point B, we'd have to call the different artillery centers and get clearance through their area, or at least ask them to stop shooting, or they'd give us you know, how to go to avoid with what they're doing. Okay, nighttime, they had what was called harassment fire. Now it was never really explained to me who they're trying to harass. <laughs> what would happen is, if I'm out in one of these base camps uh, here, Lyke, Kuchi, or other places, at two o'clock in the morning you get boom, boom, and you're in a cot and all of a sudden you're on the ground because that artillery is pointed right over you. And you say, well that was nice, I think I'll go back to bed. So that was harassment fire, and their rationale was they were harassing the enemy. Okay, but I think we really, they're harassing us just to see if we were still there. Okay, this is at Quan Loi, a little bit further north of, uh, well, there's, there's Saigon, and then Highway 13 goes kind of north from there, um, Lyke, and then this is Quan Loi, further north, sort of in the northern area of the, what we covered. And we go to these places for three days, and when we're there, this is who gives us the, uh, the mission that we're going to do. Okay, this is the uh, living area. Notice it's kind of red. Well, it's next to the runway. And when a helicopter hovers down, a huge cloud of red dirt comes up, and it slowly works its way over to where we're trying to sleep, and kind of settles down there. A note about, uh, I was talking about wood before. These are all rocket boxes and ammunition boxes. Uh, this is kind of the summertime area, but in the wintertime, it's all mud. So they've made their little wooden uh, sidewalks to go from one tent to another. These are all rubber trees, by the way. Okay, that's, our, that's the visitor's tent where we stayed. That's my medic right there. We had four little cots here. This is our bunker so that when real artillery started coming, or mortars coming in, we could run out and jump in the bunker. Um, normally you wouldn't do that because most people get injured during their running. So in reality, if stuff was really inbound, we would just roll out of the bunker, roll out of the cot and lay on the floor. That's our shower. Uh, we would... Uh, hang it from a tree limb. We get some other water, heat it up. And this already has little spikes on the bottom, or you know, ice pick holes in the bottom. And there's a little platform, a little wooden platform, and there's nothing around us, and we're out there stark naked. But after three days, I don't care who's watching, you know? I mean, it's, you really get filthy out there just by doing nothing. So we pour the hot water in and take our shower, and that was good pour some hot water in and dry off somehow and then call it a day. So life was good out in these places. You should try it. <laughs> Quan Loi Runway. A lot of C-130 traffic goes in and out. You can tell by the contrails that there's a lot of moisture there. Okay, So as the props go around, they're creating the low pressure area and the air condensers and all that good stuff. Uh, Dao Tiang. I spent more time at Dao Tiang almost than I did at Long Bin. That's my helicopter ready to go. Dao Tiang is the home of the Michelin Rover Plantation. 
They still owned the rubber plantation. It was still French owned. It was the largest rubber plantation in Vietnam. After the war in 1975, all of these plantations were you know, taken over by the, the uh, communists at that point. But right now, this was run by the French. You Even though. You couldn't toilet that either, could you? I'm sorry? They never put Agent Orange to kill them. Oh, no, they're not going to. Uh, we'd have to pay if, if we put Agent Orange on rubber trees, we'd have to pay extra. Yeah, We're already paying to, you know, yeah, habitate their precious plantation. These are all rubber trees, by the way. And you can see some of the slash marks on that guy. But there are a lot of there are a lot of plantations. So that's so when I visited Daoqiang, this is our housing area. This is some of the French housing when they were actually in control, even though they still own the place. You know, life really was not too bad. There is a above ground swimming pool. Um, I did look at it. I went upstairs, and the first time I looked at it, it was just green stuff. But one day, I, during one, one visit, they actually had it cleaned out, and I actually did use it. It was for five minutes. Couldn't stay too long because we're always on call. Going over to Tainin, this is the Cao Dai Temple, which is a indigenous Vietnamese religion, which combines Christianity, Buddhism, the Muslim religion. Victor Hugo has something to do with it. And Joan of Arc has something to do with it. That's all I know. Okay, but that's it. Now these days, that's a major tourist attraction. Okay, in the Tainan area, this is the other, the other actual pickup that I bothered to take pictures of. Um, looks like they chopped down a tree there. But anyhow, everybody's surrounding me. We're out there to pick up somebody, I don't know who. There was a, excuse, a tank running around out there in the thicker areas. I didn't see too many tanks out there actually doing stuff. It just, in, a, in the heavily wooded area, they weren't all that good. Okay, same area. We're, they're loading stuff in the back of the aircraft. Normally, during a load, the people on the ground would run up with their patient, and they've and there's probably a medic already there, you know, in their unit who probably put some band-aids on it. And then we'd, uh, our medic would put more band-aids on and give them an, start an <coughs> IV on them or something like that. And the whole point wasn't to operate on them there. The whole point was to get them to a hospital as fast as possible. So they wanted us out fast and we wanted out fast. Okay, we're landing at Tain Inn. Uh, this, ho this hospital is called a MUST hospital, M-U-S-T. Not sure what it stands for, but it's an inflatable hospital. There are three of these in Vietnam. Central air, condition, air conditioner unit for these tents, another air conditioner unit for these tents. So the tents were air conditioned and air pressure kept the whole thing inflated. Um, now over here, I don't know how many of you recognize that, Anybody recognize that? <coughs> Nui Bao Din, Black Virgin Mountain. So everything's less than 100 feet above sea level in this part of the country, except Nui Bao Din rises 3,200 feet out of the, out of the uh, terrain. And uh, the deal with Nui Bao Din is it's a good place to have a relay station for your radios. So. We were on the top, we had radios up there, we had a little post up there. We were on the bottom, we had radios down here. And the Viet Cong had the middle, and they had their radios here. And uh, I've landed on that thing a, a few times. And at night, it gets what's called a cap cloud. You know, it's, it's very moist and it's very warm. So at night, it cools off and that moist air condenses. So as the air goes up to the top, it condenses to a cloud, and then as that same parcel goes down on the other side, it heats up again, so the cloud goes away. So even though the air is going over it, the cloud stays on top. And that's a little bit interesting to try to land through the cloud onto the top. 
It's only about five miles from the Cambodian border. Okay, a uh, 175 millimeter piece hanging around at Tain Inn. <sighs> Captain James Williamson, my ever loving friend, he's the guy who taught me not, how to not make night landings. <laughs> Okay, so but he was a pretty good guy. So I, I saw him again. I flew with him later at Fort Rucker. So we're at uh, the previous slide was Tainan West, the U.S. military area. This is Tainan East, which is a special forces area. Okay, so I, I don't know exactly why we're there. You can see the runway matting, the PSP, pure steel planking, which was used throughout Vietnam to make runways and roads and whatever you need. Uh, this guy was sitting there, Air America, and another helicopter came in and left at the time we were there. This guy's having way too much fun on the Saigon River, so I was going to see if I could get him to jump overboard, and so I don't know if, it, if I succeeded or not, but anyhow, that's the Saigon River, that is... Saigon Harbor, which is the Saigon River, and Saigon is to the west of that. And the South China Sea is about 30 miles away going down the river. Okay, so some scenes of the harbor in the, uh, the uh, city itself. Okay, just general residential area. Uh, this is Saigon Tonsinu Airport. The main runways are up here. This is what's good, they call Hotel 3, or Helicopter Landing Spot Number 3, which is where we normally went. After landing down here, we taxi into the Little Red Cross, and an ambulance would normally visit us there. That's if we had American uh, wounded. If we had Vietnamese wounded, they went to a different hospital, and I would land actually out here on the ramp somewhere. I forgot now where. Yes? My name's Rick Reynolds. I was in a specialized branch in the military. But anyway, uh, I was fortunate for one instance to have both my mother and my stepfather in Vietnam at the same time I was. The picture you're just showing right there, like my stepdad, this Pete Boggs, he's 93 years old. He and my mother served in Vietnam at that base. Pacific Architects. P-A-N-E? You built our hooches. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was out first infantry for seven months, and then I came into Saigon, and I had the new Mac B. Uh huh. And I also stood on the. We lived upstairs, and I've seen trucks full of American bodies. Oh yeah. Well, uh, like I said, most of the time we went into the heliport here, but. Um, Hotel 3, which is probably one of the busiest landing spots of the whole wide war. There were times we would take people directly to the ramp for a, a C-141 direct transfer of, of patients. And then one of our pilots was, was uh, well, he was <coughs> injured very badly, and that's what happened to him. But if you look at uh, Google Maps today, this has all changed, basically. The runways are still the same orientation, but everything else is, everything else has changed. Okay, so I'm driving into, if we were driving into Saigon, this is kind of one of the little rivers that went through the city, and okay, some of the government office buildings, French architecture. Uh, the presidential palace, so the last day of the war, this is where the North Vietnamese tanks drove through the front gate, and ran with their flag to the top. Some Saigon traffic. There's a, a girl in the typical, it's called a Dao Dai, is the name for their dress there. Kind of pretty. And, and we... Could go through that but never get a spot on them. They knew how to do it. Yeah. We didn't. I didn't, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Off limits to U.S. personnel, so there are places that we weren't supposed to go. Okay, that's an F-4 Phantom, that's a Saigon Tonsinut, and I'm shooting through the window of a Boeing 707. I'm going on r and &R. I'm getting that. I'm not gonna say it, I'm just getting out. Okay, so 
there were eight or nine places where you could go to R&R &R, um, on. Um, mostly, you know, like uh, Taipei, Bangkok, um, Singapore, Penang, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, married guys had the option to go to Hawaii, uh, but, you know, it would be his expense to get his wife to Hawaii. Yeah, so, but I went to, uh, where is this? Okay, we were fueling at Darwin, Australia. We're head, it's about halfway from Saigon to Sydney. That is actually a military air base, so there weren't a whole lot of civilian aircraft, but they let us do it, whatever. Okay, so we're in Sydney, and that's the opera house being built. And it's another view of the opera house. And that's all I'm going to show you about R and R, okay? Because what goes on in R or what happens in R and R stays in R and R. Okay. okay. So, ironically, if you remember back in history, this is the same week that the USS Pueblo was hijacked by the North Vietnamese or North Koreans. The, our intelligence ship was taken. And they kept the crew for a while, but that made news back in the states. So. R&R &R is over. We're back um, south of Saigon. This is the Mekong River, the muddy Mekong. And this is one of the tributaries. And we're flying around. We went to a number of places along the river for pickups. OK, there's some barges going by. And up here, you can see a little bit of water. This is Dong Tam. So, during the time that I was there, the U.S. military built a army slash navy base on this part of the river, and they had a little harbor, and there was a U.S. Army hospital in here, and we're going to the, eventually to the hospital. Getting closer to the harbor, that's how it looks. Now, you can't see it from here, but if you look real close behind that building, what you're going to see is these guys hiding there. The Riverine Force, U.S. Navy Riverine Force, also known as the Brownwater Navy. So that's a monitored gunboat there and a modified, some mod other boats which are modified. So we're landing at the hospital here, another inflatable hospital. We're actually landing there. This is the hospital. It's one of these inflated hospitals. During one point in the war when I was not here, they did get a mortar attack. It deflated all the buildings and it killed three uh, U.S. female nurses. Okay, coming into it from the other angle. Okay, that's the hospital. This is where we're going to land, and they wheel the patients across there. There's the harbor, Mekong River. That's where we stayed during our three days there. And another PA and E project, I'm sure. So. Uh, Okay, I didn't take this picture, but you know that's one of our helicopters. We're landing on one of these things here. A lot of these boats, barges, and landing craft had little heliports or little helipads on top. Didn't take that picture, but uh, that could be me sitting there. I don't know who took the picture, but anyhow, there's a bunch of uh, people sitting on the uh, ramp there. We had to land crosswise. If we landed with a nose headed toward the rear, the tail would get into the bush. If we landed otherwise, with a nose up here, the tail would get into the antennas and structure of the boat. So we had to land crosswise. Um, the trick about that is all these boats that the riverine force was using, they didn't really anchor. They just kept the engines running and parked, nosed into the you know, the bank. So that if they had to, they could go into reverse and get out real quick. <clears throat> when we landed a helicopter board, if we did not land in the center of the boat, the boat would lean one way or the other. That would overheat the engine of the boat and we'd have to reposition the helicopter. Okay, there's, that's not one of our helicopters, but it just shows one guy on a boat. So uh, the Navy had its own helicopters, as well as the Army was using this also. This is during a, uh, in the latter part of my stay there, we were uh, 
supporting a Vietnamese marine operation, and they, uh, they actually lost a lot of people on that. Okay, just a black and white photo just shows a better shot of a, how you would actually have to land crosswise on that and land in the center, otherwise the whole boat's gonna rebel. I believe we're east of Saigon now, going through tea plantations to a place called Swan Lock, X-U-A-N-L-O-C. Swan Lock is notable is in that it was the last holdout of the South Vietnamese Army at the end of the war, and then after they, you know, they were outnumbered, outgunned, out everything, they did good you know, for what they had, but at the end of that, there was no more resistance for, for the North, Vietnam, North Vietnamese to go into Saigon itself. That was the last point of resistance of the war. This is not a bomb uh, explosion. This is after I had taken off, and it just shows the dust cloud, okay? So which is a good reason to have that instrument takeoff training at Fort Rucker, because basically as soon as you started pulling pitch with a, with a collective, which is your power lever, and then, and then of course the cyclic is the other, and I'll talk about later tomorrow if you want to talk about that, okay? But that's how to fly a helicopter and what the pieces are, that's a different subject. Anyhow, taking off, as we lift up, the air is coming down, and as you know, as I told you, it's either dust or mud, and there it was dust, and that's the, the central part of the Swan Lock, and I don't know why we landed there. But then you would actually go, you would lose all visual reference as you're taking off, because the dust is going to get up there before you are. So you'd have to be on the, on the instruments and ready to, to, to do an actual instrument takeoff. So that's the result of that. And when I landed, it looked the same, and you have to wait for the dust to settle before you take off. Okay, this is Swan Lock International Airport. Just proved to people that I've been there, and we had three bird dogs stationed there, so. I have been to Swan Lock, okay. Okay, we're headed south now towards Vung Tau. Vung Tau is at the end of a peninsula. This is about 30 miles southeast of Saigon. Um, so that's coming from Saigon to Vung Tau. It's basically all mangrove swamp. There's not a whole lot out there. Um, although I did make some landings down there at one point or another. Okay, got a shot of that. E you know, even Chinooks need a little help once in a while. So that's a sky crane. And then we're, again, we're on the Vung Tau Peninsula and down by the mountains at the tip is where the city is. And Vang Tau is an in-country R&R place for uh, US troops. So we go there for several days sometimes and get on the beach. Didn't they put hospital pods, pick them up and take them different places? Uh, this guy crane, yeah. Um, but I never saw them used in Vietnam. It would attach right under there. And it's it, sort of a mobile surgical spot, but basically it was just faster to get a Huey in, take the guy out to a real hospital, okay? At least I thought that was the rationale. But anyhow, we're looking at Vung Tau. All, all around the country you'd see these little RFPF, or little hamlet defensive centers that the Army set up, or the South Vietnamese are really set up, to, so little village Populations can protect themselves at night, was the idea. Okay, we're on the uh, ocean side, getting close to Vung Tau. Um, the beach is along there, the town is here. Beautiful town. Yeah, it, it was. It was a good resort area then, and I guess it's a fabulous resort area now. So we're on the bay side of the uh, town, looking at the town. French architecture. There's the beach. I spent several days there myself. We, I just, we flew in, they landed right on the beach. I got out, spent a few days there, went to the Grand Hotel and just basically enjoyed. They this is ships in the harbor. We spent a million dollars a day with those ships to hold because you could only send so many up the river. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. 
Uh-huh. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, anyhow, I was going to say this is the only place I've ever tried to surf. I know. <laughs> okay. Just about killed myself. Okay, I'm going to try and get through this. We're landing at the air base at Vung Tau. It was a major maintenance center for the Air Force, the Army. There's some Army Mohawk birds. Another. Okay, the Navy's there, and there was some radar up, and he's right over the airstrip. Uh, about two months after I got there, two B-52s collided 46 nautical miles south of here in the Ch South China Sea. So they sent anybody they could get a hold of to go 46 nautical miles in, over the ocean. No flotation gear, no nothing. He's, you know, we're <laughs> flying around over the ocean about 10 feet and you say, well, I hope the engine doesn't quit. But anyhow, we didn't find anything because anything that, that had been found was already found. And I, everybody was lost aboard the aircraft. Don't know why it happened, but as a result of that, we got qualified in landing on Navy ships. So that's in, in the Vung Tau area right there, some other Navy ships. So much going up the coast, Cap St. Jacques was where the Viet Cong had their in-country R&R center. We never went in there. Okay, further up north is Nui Dat, which was the Australian compound. They had their own little world, and they were on the beach there in their birthday suits. But so we're landing at, at Nui Dat, and we spent a few days there. So that's Australian stuff there. There's a Royal Australian Air Force Huey. And eventually they built a little concrete pad for us. Okay, we're checking out a dead VC. And these are people from the medical center at the Australian compound. The best meal I ever had was at the, uh, December 1967 uh, Christmas dinner at the Australian Open, uh, Officers Open Mess. It was nice. Further east, Fan Thiet. Um, I'm just going to have to start going through this. We built a runway there. Um, it's south on, on the South China Sea. Uh, Fan Thiet City is in the distance, fishing village, but we had, we stayed here several days. Okay, kind of a busy airport. That's from the 1st Cavalry Division. It has a Red Cross, but it also is ready to mount an M60 here. We did not mount M60s. We stayed in that. Not in the best condition, but it was better than a tent sometimes. Right on the South China Sea. Uh, a French-built pillbox to hold a machine gun, French barbed wire, signs all around saying landmines in French. The city, kind of a, it was kind of nice walking around there. Uh, and if you need your helicopter washed, you can take it down to the local helicopter washing mat. <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know what we paid these kids, but I'm sure it was too, more than what they were getting or earning. In the city itself, just it was amazing how easy it was to walk around here. Normally, you wouldn't uh, do this. We're in a little tourist shop, typical pajama uniforms, or not uniforms, but wearing attire for, for civilian Vietnamese. Okay, uh, this is sort of a uh, nighttime... Uh, well, at nighttime, it'd probably be uh, visited by the uh, U.S. troops. Up here it says, Beer 33. Bombity Bomb 33 was the local rot gut that they produced. And I tried it, and I went back to Schlitz. And, but, but anyhow, it's, it's 40 p or whatever the number is there in piastres. And that's U.S. military script is what they're talking about. I never saw a real dollar bill over there. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, this is. She looked pretty nice. We figured she had some French influence. So what the heck? Take a picture of her. That's a graveyard outside Fantheat. Everything's above ground. I don't know what slide number this is. But anyhow, we're uh, going up. We're going up the coast here. We need to pick up some new helicopters. I'm in the back seat. I'm part of the crew, bringing back the new helicopters. Okay. Along the way, we sometimes see uh, scenes like this, stretches of 
defoliated jungle, AKA or Agent Orange. Okay, that's the result of Agent Orange. We're right on the coast here. That's sand on the coast. Okay, they're trying to refuel, they're trying, getting our new helicopters, coming back south, in and out of the weather, passing Camran Bay, Air Force Base there, passing a Navy cruiser, and we got an, just, okay, boat, how's it? <laughs> it had guns on it, I can tell you that, because they were shooting our way. <laughs> Anyhow, we had an intel briefing before the trip, and they said, there's no naval artillery. Don't worry about it. So we were flying south. He was there. He was shooting big orange things coming out of his barrels this way, and then big explosions going on over there. So, so much for intelligence. I see it. Okay, I'm going. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're on a standby someplace out in the, out in the woods. That's the perimeter right there, okay? This is a huge area. These guys have been out there for a while and they're, okay, we're, we're having a class on how to change a track on a duster, but it took them a while to figure that out. Okay. Oh, we're getting close to the end. Finally, I said, to heck with this place, I'm going home. So this is Kadena Air Base, Okinawa, and I just happened to be sitting next to the window and uh, I thought that was a pretty lucky shot. These guys were all bombed up and ready to do, ready to pay a visit, bombs under there. Okay, there was three of them. And, uh, okay, back at Fort Rucker, just as a sidebar while I'm, this is the last slide, okay. Um, the guy who taught me how to not make night landings in Vietnam uh, flew for the medevac unit at Fort Rucker. Fort Rucker and a lot of the other training bases in in, uh, in the states during the early 70s had a had a program called MAST M A S T Military Assistance to Safety and Traffic. So eventually they would be called to pick up people on highways. Well, eventually with all the excess helicopter pilots running around in the 70 early 70s, they said, "We can do this." And that was the start, at that point, that was the start of the civil, civilian EMS helicopter operations in the states. Most other countries use state-sponsored EMS uh, programs, but here in the states we, we use private contractors. Flight for Life out of Denver was the very first civilian, totally civilian EMS helicopter operation in the United States. It started in 1972. Okay, so uh, it's hard to take up all your time. Weren't there helicopters French made also? Yeah, well, the, the, um, especially in the States, the Alouette 3, which when uh, Flight for Life started, it used an Alouette 3. And what they use right now is, is called an AS350B3, which is also French. French helicopters are much better at altitude than American helicopters. <coughs> I did work for Flight for Life for a while, and, the, and I flew the AS350 B3, and a year before I started with Flight for Life, that same kind of helicopter landed on the top of Mount Everest two days in a row, 29,028 feet or whatever. And you can't hardly get a higher place than that. So they have the best helicopters for mountain operations. For lower elevations, like along the states that are low level, they, they'll use bigger helicopters. They can carry more people, but they're not good out here in the West. Any questions? I got one. Very good. Go ahead. You explained the, uh, you said you had three helicopters on a mission at one time. Did you mention a third helicopter? Well, first up was the first guy to go. He got the first siren. Second up was the guy with the, the rescue hoist. He got he, he would go first if, if they needed a rescue hoist. But he would be, after first up went, if they needed another, second up would go. Third up was hospital transfers, basically. And he wasn't, you know, and he would just work in daytime. But he could be pressed in service at any time. Any of them could do anything anywhere, if, whatever the need was at the time. But, yes. What's the origin of the term dust off? 
Uh, I actually read about that the other day. Um, when the US military got into Vietnam, it was the Navy who organized what the call signs was for everybody, all the services. And every so often they changed the call signs, which caused confusion. Well, about that time, the Army said, let's have a, a single call sign for the medevacs, okay? So that decision got implanted into what the Navy was doing. They said, okay. So at the time of that change, dust off happened to be the call sign for medevac helicopters. And so there was no pre-planning for it. But that's what it was at that time in space. So they just kept that call sign for helicopters. And so people, you know, there's, there's an acronym dedicated on air, on, you know, unerring service to our fighting forces, blah. That's a dust off. Another thing is to say that when you come in at a hot, and you're coming in rather fast to these LZs, you don't make normal approaches. You're jinking, you're jiving, you're coming in as fast as possible. Last second, put the tail up and set it on the ground. I mean, you learn how to do that after a while. That creates a lot of dust. <laughs> so people could say you've been dusted off. And so that's, but anyhow, it was, it was what I just explained how, explained how the word came about. It was already in use at the end of that SOI period or signals period for that, for the whole country. Yes. Any other questions? I was just saying, Chuck, thank you for your service. Yes. I was with the 45th. Sure. Yeah. Really Good to meet someone from the 45th. Who else was served in Vietnam, just out of curiosity? Yeah. So, again, we have a variety of us with different experiences. Uh, so we certainly hope you'll stick around and let's visit a little bit. Uh, what we haven't covered, and we're going to get Chuck back, is if you notice from the handout, we have an interesting assignment as a Cobra pilot. That's the other extreme from a dust off. We had experiences in, in uh, Iran uh, and also Afghanistan. Uh, you know, there are essentially three, four additional years of some exciting uh, of flying experiences, so we'll get Chuck back for that. Also, we're going to take a break and everything. He has some <laughs> quite fascinating videos he took while flying around. And again, you'll see some of the same images, but uh, there's some fresh stuff in there too. So we'll show that after a, a break. You know, uh, We hope you'll stick around either for that or visit with the museum. Uh, and Chuck, just to give you a, a little remembrance of Thank talking you. with us, uh, one of our challenge coins. Okay. Uh, the one last thing is, how many of you ever visit YouTube? Visited well, there, YouTube. Well, if you go on YouTube, look up Broomfield Veterans Memorial Museum and subscribe to that, you'll be able to get the latest things of what's going on <coughs> in the museum and some of our early